Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the last lecture in module 8 and the last part of microscopy. This is lecture 43. Um, so as I mentioned in the previous lecture, we are going to be covering the remaining part of light microscopy as well as electron microscopy and a few other recent developments in microscopic methods. So let's continue with light microscopy. Um, here I have two different modifications, one is phase contrast and the other is dark field. Um, here is a simple schematic that shows us the light path in bright field microscopy, in phase contrast and dark field microscopes. So we'll start with phase contrast. So in phase contrast, we have our light source and there is an annular diaphragm right in front of the light source. What it does is it forces a fraction of the light to pass through the annular diaphragm and then through the condenser lens. This light is then brought to focus on the specimen. Now depending on the organelles in the sample, uh, each of these organelles is going to have small differences in refractive indices and because of that the path length is going to be altered. So the direction of the light is going to be altered which is shown with red arrows and the light that is transmitted right through the specimen that is unaltered is shown in blue. So these blue as well as light, uh, the refracted light as well as the transmitted light is going to be passing through the objective lens. It will then pass through what is called a diffraction plate and then it will reach the ocular lens and the eye. What happens in this case like I said is we are utilizing the differences in refractive indices of the different parts of the cell to create an image and uh, this results in greater differentiation of the internal structures and the biggest thing that is pointed out here is that the outer um, covering or the external covering or pellicle of the cell is clearly visible which in contrast to bright field because in bright field you have a light pellicle against a light background so it's not very clear. In this case you have a dark background and a light colored pellicle. So this uh, outer external covering of the cell is basically much clearer in phase contrast microscopy. And I think one of the other textbooks mentions very clearly that one of the advantages of phase contrast is that wet mount applications are possible. So you don't have to have dry mount which in some cases can distort the features of the cell. Then we come to dark field. In dark field, the specimen is lit from the sides. Now, I've mentioned in bright field that the light is passing through the condenser lens. It's brought to focus on the specimen. It's being transmitted through the specimen. We are dealing with bacteria or other microorganisms. And wherever it's not able, wherever light is not able to pass because of the presence of certain organelles, that is seen as dark. So these organelles are dark and all the others are light because light is either reflected or passing through. So these are the things that happen in bright field. Now here in dark field, an opaque disk is placed in front of the light source. So whatever is going by the side of the opaque disk is being uh, brought to focus using a condenser lens on the specimen. So here we have the specimen. So some part of the light will be lost, it's scattered and that is shown by the red arrows. The blue light is what is passing through the specimen and that is collected by the objective lens and to the uh, ocular lens and then the eye. 
this results in a very peculiar image. You have a dark field. Uh, it's a dark field microscope, so you have a dark background and you are illuminating the object by reflected light. So it's only the, it's a part of the entire light that is coming. It's only the reflected light that is caught and uh, is used to generate this image. So this is basically what you get. So these are uh, outputs of these uh, types of microscopes. So the first one, this is a sample of tissue paper. You have a light background and light is passing through the specimen. So you know that either light will pass through the specimen, that's transmitted light, or any material that is in the water sample is going to be either reflected, scattered, or absorbed. So when it is dark, the darker it is, it means it's absorbing all the wavelengths. Reflected light is where you see color. So whatever color you see is the reflected color. And um, scattered is basically not going to be of much use except in uh, dark field microscopy. So that is where you're looking at the scattered light or the light reflected from the sides of the specimen. So um, let me see. So here you have bright field, phase contrast. You can see in this case the background is not completely dark. Here it's slightly grayish black. So there are all kinds of images on the internet. There are light backgrounds, dark backgrounds, black backgrounds, all of that is there. And this is mainly because of differences in the refractive indices of the different materials and the interference of light paths. So you can refer to the textbook for more detail. It's be explained much better, yeah. And then we have dark field. So dark field, like I said, is reflected light and that's what you get against a dark background. All right, so we now come to a new development in light microscopy and that is fluorescence microscopy. Uh, I need to remind everyone that fluorescence is a phenomenon where the light emitted by the object is at a different wavelength compared to the incident light. So some of you may be familiar with the natural fluorescence of chlorophyll. Now, um, we know that under sunlight conditions, if any um, cell has chlorophyll in it, it looks green. We are all familiar with algae and so on. In our environments, including plants, all of them have a green color because of the presence of chlorophyll molecules. Now, when I see an object as green, it means that the light is, it light can do various things. It can be reflected, it can be transmitted, it can be absorbed, it can be scattered. When I see a particular color, it means that wavelength, the wavelength that is coming to my eye is reflected light. So when I see something as green, red or yellow, then that is the color that is being reflected back into my eye. All other colors are either being absorbed or transmitted through the sample. When I say that chlorophyll is naturally fluorescent, one of the most um, important experiments that many of you may be familiar with is to put UV, put this chlorophyll under UV light. Now UV light has a wavelength below 300 nanometers. Under UV light, chlorophyll does not look green, it looks red and that is because of this fluorescence of chlorophyll. So, uh, the same phenomenon can be used to visualize all other types of cells which do not have naturally fluorescent compounds like chlorophyll. So, we can use fluorescent dyes and this is what we see over here. This is from a paper and here you see yeast cells. These yeast cells have been dyed by fluorescent markers or dyes and they have attached themselves to the cell membranes. Now these cell membranes have different types of different colors and so on. So it's much easier to look at the cell using a fluorescence microscope and therefore um, you can like I said, it's much easier to see particular parts of the cell. In this case, it's the cell membrane. In the second case, in uh, B, this is from a particular paper recently published, I think. And this is Staphylococcus aureus that has been observed using fluorescence microscopy and more than one dye. 
So here you see a series of images which have been uh, taken using after the cells have been dyed with uh, three different fluorescent dyes and each one of them will react with the cell membrane. Now if the cell membrane is intact it means the cell is likely to be alive and viable and capable of reproducing. On the other hand if the cell membrane has been damaged then the reaction to the fluorescent dye is going to be different. The color that uh, is caught in this case is red. In the case of the living or intact uh, in case of the living cells or intact cell membranes, the color is green and that is because of different dyes reacting in a different manner. Um, so this kind of difference in the reaction of different cells to these dyes can be used to separate living cells from dead cells. And in this particular paper, they have used image processing software to enumerate cells under these different conditions and that's those are the numbers that is the number of um, I think dead cells yes the, I think it's the number of dead cells that are uh, shown in these series of images uh, where the green cells are living cells and the red cells are dead cells. So uh, that is a major uh, advancement you might say because one of the biggest limitations in uh, microscopy is that you we did not have the ability to differentiate between living and dead cells. Now if we are able to use this kind of method and uh, differentiate between living and dead cells then it becomes very easy and we don't have to go for plate counts and so on. As I said we uh, can also visualize specific cell organelles. And then we come to another major advancement. Uh, so I think I mentioned in my introductory lecture that um, super resolved fluorescence microscopy was given a Nobel Prize I think in 2014. And one of that uh, one of the reasons is that super resolved fluorescence microscopy has uh, it has allowed us to image uh, certain structures within the cells resulting in 3D images where the resolution has gone down by uh, 10 times. So instead of the limit of 200 nanometers, now the limit is 20 nanometers and people are uh, working on pushing the limit even further to maybe uh, 1 or 2 nanometers. So this was unimaginable with light microscopy. So it's a huge um, uh, advancement like I said in light microscopy and uh, the current results which I'm going to show you in a little bit is 3D images that have been achieved with a resolution of 20 nanometers by 40 to 50 nanometers. So the one that I'm going to focus on in this particular case is C. C is a mitochondrial membrane and since um, you know a little bit about mitochondria so it may have some relevance. So this is a 3D image of a mitochondrial outer membrane that has been stained by a particular protein. So this protein has fluorescence properties and therefore it can be imaged under a fluorescence microscope and you can see the uh, detail it's all the it's around uh, 240 nanometers and the basic principle of this uh, super resolved microscopy or in this case the sto stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy and so on the idea is that you have fluorescent dyes which, at which attach themselves to particular cell organelles so you're not looking at the entirety of the cell which we saw in dark field bright field and phase contrast in this case we are looking at only particular cell organelles so if you have a structure like this you're going to be able to attach the fluorescent dye only to these fibers and that's what is shown over here and the end result is an image like this. So you don't have an image of the entire structure under the microscope but you have uh, enhanced images of only specific organelles that are part of the cell. In any case it is an important development.
Okay, so that's about fluorescence light microscopy. Uh, let's move to another method. The next method is called differential interference contrast micros microscopy or DIC. In this case, non-polarized light is passed through a polarizer. The polarizer uh, will split the light into two beams. Those are passed through two prisms and what reaches the ocular lens again because of interference patterns that are generated by differences in refractive indices of the different cell organelles that will create a particular image and these are um, these interference patterns of light will be used to generate these images and this is one of the outcomes so this is a micro plant cell then we come to another modification which is also becoming very popular and that is confocal scanning laser micros uh, microscopy. So here we have a laser beam. It is reflected of a mirror. This beam after reflection of a mirror passes through a scanner which has a pinhole and then it is incident on the specimen. Now if you generate a series of images by changing the plane of focus. This plane of focus is going to be changed again and again. That will allow a series of images to be formed which can then be assembled together to create a 3D image of the specimen. So here are some examples of both DIC microscopes and confocal microscopes. So in the phase contrast, again just like phase contrast, the two are similar phase contrast and DIC use differences in refractive indices of the different cell organelles to produce an image and this is a paramecium we have already seen several bright field images of paramecium and this is a, a DIC image of a paramecium and uh, then we have confocal microscope images so here are 3D images again of a paramecium and the enhanced uh, organelle is these contractile vacuoles within the cell. Um, another one that is shown over here is a ciliated protozoa. You know that uh, paramecium is also a ciliated protozoan and this is a different one. This is tetrahymena which has uh, cilia. So it's the cilia that have been dyed by a fluorescent um, dye and under confocal microscopy you can see the cilia very clearly. Here is another output from confocal laser uh, scanning uh, microscopes and uh, here I think again they are either fluorescent dyes or some other image enhancing uh, method. So these days what you have is a lot of image processing software that can be used to enhance different parts of the image that is generated either by light microscopy or even electron microscopy. So here we have diatoms. These diatoms have different organelles. So we have the cell wall. The cell wall is cyan colored. So cyan is a bright blue. So this fluorescent blue is the cyan color and that is the cell wall. The red color is uh, uh, associated with the chloroplasts. There is blue DNA which is a little hard to see but in this particular case you can see some blue um, material at the center of the cell and that's the DNA. Then you have the green membranes. So here you have the green membranes and you have se several other uh, organelles that are part of these diatoms. And I've already mentioned that diatoms are a major group of algae which are found in oceans and waterways. They are considered to uh, contribute to the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. They are major contributors and so on. So that's um, all about fluorescence light microscopy and these are some of the images that we have been able to get with the fluorescence microscope in our lab. So here we have Staphylococcus which is a gram positive bacterium. It was isolated from groundwater and you can see because of the dark purple, it's not black, it looks black but it's really a dark purple colored uh, bacterium because of the gram staining method. So you can see very clearly it's coxoid and um, it's gram positive because of the dark purple color and this is from groundwater. 
Here we have a mixture of gram positive and gram negative cells and I've already mentioned to you that the staining procedure results in purple cells for gram positive bacteria and red cells for gram negative bacteria. Now when you have wastewater, wastewater has thousands of different types of cells and under the light microscope, so this is a bright field image, under the bright field uh, image in this you can see most of the cells are purple and some of the cells are pink but it's very hard to see them and under uh, the filter so this fluorescence microscope has many options it's got a bright field option it's got a dark field option and a fluorescence option now in fluorescence microscopy we also use something which i did not talk about and that is a filter now this filter is the excitation filter which allows only certain wavelengths of light to pass through this light is incident on the object and then the wavelength that is emitted by the object is a different uh, wavelength so that goes through the dichroic mirror and then to the uh, ocular through the emission filter and the ocular lens finally to the detector so this is what you are looking at. We have specific filters and specific dyes and the combination of the filter and the dye will result in different colors. So coming back to this, we can see that the colors are a little more obvious. Here purple and pink are not so easy to differentiate. Pink is so light in comparison to purple that everything looks more or less purple. So here you can see there are yellow orange colors and a faded green color so you can see the same image through the fluorescent uh, my the fluorescence uh, um, option in the microscope will give you this kind of image which is sometimes better so if you have a software for enumerating the bacteria it makes it easier to differentiate the color and therefore the images and enumerate the bacteria on that basis. This is a raw water sample again the same thing it has a mixture of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Uh, the method of isolation was a spread plate and the same thing is shown over here it actually has a mixture of purple and pink cells but you can see purple is much darker compared to pink so purple dominates under bright field it's very it, I would say no one would probably want to uh, count the pink cells they are there but they are hard to see through the filter in the fluorescence option you can see the different colors so you have green and orange cells and they are much easier to distinguish all right so here we have uh, more images using fluorescence microscopy and we have limited ourselves up, in, up until now to acridine orange so in this particular case, we have acridine orange, we have a filter called Tritsi and like I said, a filter is part of the fluorescence phenomenon in uh, fluorescence microscopes. It is the combination of the dye and the filter which results in an image and you can see uh, the wastewater sample and E. coli. You can see most of it is E. coli. Now I should also make it a point to say over here that you can't really identify the bacteria in a particular sample unless it is uh, already isolated and then visualized under the microscope. So most likely the wastewater contains large numbers of E. coli but it needs to be verified using biochemical tests. Uh, here is another uh, bacterium and that is Begetoia. Um, taken from a tap water sample the dye and the filter remain the same more images so we have fluorescent images um, you can see green fluorescence now I also need to make another point over here when we use acridine orange acridine orange is a fluorescent dye but it fades very very quickly especially when there is stray light in the room so all this work the fluorescence microscopy work has to be done in a dark room pitch dark so that the fluorescent dye does not lose its fluorescence because it's a very very short half-life for these fluorescent dyes now this green uh, image 
is after the dye has kind of faded away. This is just acridine orange, no other dye. And the orange and yellow colors are associated with the dye at the time it, that it is created. So the very first five minutes is when you can do some useful work with this dye. And that's why having a camera and a PC is very important because then you can capture the images in the very first five minutes and then count the number of bacteria when you get time. So this is useful for enumerating bacteria and for um, storing images on either a PC or any other device. So uh, this has taken a lot of the tedium out of enumeration of bacteria. So you cannot distinguish between living and dead cells. So uh, I should make it a point to say that green and yellow over here are not living and dead cells. It's just the fading of acridine orange. Okay, then we come to another major um, advancement in uh, microscopy and that is the use of electron microscopes. Now within electron microscopy, we have two major types of microscopes. One is canning electron microscopes and the other is transmission electron microscopes. Now in transmission electron, in fact in both, uh, electrons are uh, used instead of light rays and electromagnets are used instead of lenses. Now we are not visualizing images um, in electron microscopy in the same way as we do in light microscopes. So in light microscopes we are actually looking at the image and whether we do it through an ocular lens or we do it through a camera, either way it is the uh, actual visual image. In electron microscopes, you're not really looking at the object, you're generating an image utilizing uh, this principle of electrons as ele uh, light rays and electromagnets as lenses, then you generate an image, which is again uh, through image processing software and that is how you visualize the specimen. Uh, transmission electron microscopes have very high resolution, it goes up down to one nanometer in comparison to light microscopes which have a, a normal uh, detection limit of 0.2 microns. So this level of resolution will allow you to see greater detail of cell structures. I see that here. Yeah. So here you have a cell, this is Bacillus subtilis and it has, you can see the bar, it's 200 nanometers. So you can see uh, these are the fimbriae, most likely these are the fimbriae around the cell. The cell wall is visible, the plasma membrane is visible and so is the entire cytoplasm. So you can see that the DNA is most probably uh, distributed throughout the cytoplasm. Thin sections of 20 to 60 nanometers have to be prepared for the electron beams to pass through. They cannot pass through an entire cell. And for creating the sections, you need a, a fair amount of preparation. Preparation is done, preparation of the sample is done by providing staining with heavy atomic substances like osmium, uh, permanganate, lead, uranium or lanthanum salts. So this uh, will help in, first thing you do is stain the uh, section and then improve the contrast and so on. So like I said, the magnification is around 100,000 times. In scanning electron microscope, you don't get the same level of detail, you do not have a sectional view, you can only visualize the external features of the object. And you again need specimen preparation or sample preparation. The specimen has to be coated with heavy metals like gold and the electron beam is uh, scattered off this surface to generate an image. The magnification that we've been able to get is up to 20,000 times. So here we have some images from our lab. Here we have fly ash particles. Fly ash particles are basically the particles that are released after coal is burnt in thermal power plants and it comes out through the flue gases and when these particles settle, this is what we get. This is the fly ash we get after these particles settle back to the ground. And they are generally spherical. I think the degree of sphericity is associated with the degree of combustion. So the greater the uh, combustion of the coal, 
the more spherical the particle is likely to be. So these are 10 microns. Uh, this is the scale 10 microns and this is magnification in the optical range. This is about 1000 times and the second one is 2000 times. You can see this is the center of the image that has been enhanced in the second case. In the next image, what you see is SEM images and it's very difficult to understand. Uh, let me say two things over here. One is the magnification, 6000 times magnification and the scale is 2 microns. So, each of these spheres, they can be uh, coxoid bacteria because it's the same range in terms of size or they can be granules of compost. This is uh, a compost sample, so it can be either. Now, you can understand why uh, simply using electron microscopy is not sufficient for identifying an unknown object. You need several methods to verify whether the particular object that is under the microscope is actually what you uh, think it may be. So, like I said, this may be a coxoid, uh, this may be coxoid bacteria or it may be granules of compost or any other thing as well. Then we come to another type of microscopy and that is scanned probe microscopy. Within that we have two options, we have scanning, tunneling microscopes and atomic force microscopes. So, the biggest benefit of these types of microscopes are that no sample preparation is required unlike electron microscopes. You can visualize molecules and atoms very easily. Um, we don't have these images. I can add these images later. And then we come to scanning uh, tunneling microscopes, STM for short, where we use a thin metal probe to scan the surface. So we have a stylus type metal probe and this metal probe will uh, move as the surface of the specimen uh, varies. So the height of the specimen, um, the surface of the specimen will vary and the stylus will move along with that surface. So the same principle is applied in both types of microscopy. In scanning tunneling microscopes, you have a thin metal called, uh, it may be tungsten that is used to scan the surface. The resolution that they are claiming is one hundredth of an atom. So one hundredth of an angstrom is what is um, possible with scanning tunneling microscopes. This can allow you to study chemical and magnetic properties of materials as well as temperature variations within the cell. With atomic force microscopes, we have a metal diamond probe that is used to generate 3D images. Again, no preparation is required and we can go down to a level of 2 nanometers or even less than that. These are some outputs from atomic force microscopy. So we have different cells, lactobacillus rhamnosus, lac lactococcus lactis, lactobacillus plantarum, all these are different types of species which have been visualized using atomic force microscopes. Now, um, it's important uh, for me to say something over here that if you have a pure culture which has been uh, defined as a pure culture either based on plate counts or biochemical testing and so on, then you can use these pure cultures and uh, follow it up with atomic force or scanned probe microscopy and then get an idea of what the individual cells of that particular species looks like. So, it takes a combination of two or three methods to uh, understand more about any particular species. So, these are atomic force images, then we have a fluorescence microscope image and an another uh, correlative AFM image of a macrophage. These are um, other outputs from our lab. So, we have membrane filtration with plating. This is under a magnifying, simple magnifying glass will give you an idea of the size of the colonies. You can, if you have a chromogenic media, you can differentiate different types of species based on the color of the colonies and the texture, size, shape of the colonies. All these things can be done. And then we have SEM images. So, in the first case, we have E. coli. Uh, this has a magnification of 15,000 times. So, the images are pretty clear. 
you can see individual cells you can see their shape their size and texture all these things are visible under 15000 magnification and you can go all the way to 80000 but in this case the image is slightly blurred in either case these are sem images then we have two other sets of samples we have groundwater and wastewater samples you can see uh, that when you're dealing with natural water samples you have a huge amount of mix of species as well as organic matter from various other sources so it becomes very difficult to differentiate between microorganisms and the organic matrix that may be part of the sample so you can see in the groundwater sample there's a lot of organic material as well as inorganic material and it's very difficult to make sense out of these images now in wastewater because the bacterial population is so much higher you can see these repeating images and these re repeating images are most likely to be microbes which has to be confirmed by other tests and you can see uh, based on the size based on the fact that you have repeating images of uh, sim similar types of objects so that is what uh, tells us to a great extent that these are uh, microbes that are present in wastewater. Here are images that have nothing to do with microbiology but are outputs from our lab just to show you what is possible with atomic force microscopes. So this is a low density polyethylene film and in the xy direction our scale is in microns but in the z direction or the elevation or height of the sample we have nanometers so you can measure the roughness of a film or any other object so you can measure the height so what you're getting is 3d information about the object so this is the original film and this is after exposure to uv light you can see how the roughness has increased because of degradation of the film and this roughness you can take a, a sectional view of the change in elevation of the film so in this case a sectional view at this point has been taken and the roughness has been measured for the original film and compared with the radiate uh, uv uh, radiated film so you can see the level of roughness in nanometers and that these are some of the things that can be done with atomic force microscopy then I'm going to end this particular lecture with a little bit about the history of microscopy because it's obviously a very important part of microbiology because without microscopes we would not be able to understand or visualize the microorganisms that we are all interested in. So the earliest microscopes and magnifying glasses, they were more like magnifying glasses, they are as old as um, the 14th century or in the 1300s. And the first microscope was uh, invented by Galileo and that was in 1609. The first compound microscope was in 1620. Okay, so in the late 15th century, the first observation of microbes was made by Van Leeuwenhoek. And then we have 1729 when achromatic lenses were uh, invented by Chester Moore and Hall. And then 1830 onwards, there have been uh, there's been a huge um, increment in the use of compound light microscopes and our ability to visualize objects using these microscopes then comes 1930 when the first electron microscope was invented by Noll and Ruska in 1981 the scanning tunneling microscope was invented by Benig and Rohrer and in 1986 atomic force microscopes were invented by the same group of researchers or scientists and over here in the uh, top right corner what you see is resolution over time by now you're all clear about the fact that improving the resolution of microscopes is the main objective in microscopy and we have now reached a level that is far below one angstrom so we can now visualize molecular structures, we can visualize DNA, molecules, proteins, all of these can now be visualized very easily. 
the resolution of optical microscopes as I've already said under fluorescence microscopy it has now reached around 20 nanometers so now we are somewhere in this region with optical microscopes it's not limited to 200 nanometers that's what you're seeing over here is about 200 nanometers but we are now at the level of 20 nanometers with light microscopes with transmission electron microscopes uh, we can go to uh, about 0.2 nanometers but with aberration correction transmission electron microscopes it's far below one angstrom so 0.1 nanometer is one angstrom and we can go beyond that. I will end it at this point. Thank you.